Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Hi, everybody. So last week, as part of Zibby's Virtual Book Club, we had Anne Lamott as a guest. And for those of you who are not members of Zibby's Virtual Book Club, you should sign up. It's on book clubs with a Z, and you can access it through zibbyowens.com and go to the read tab and then go to Zibby's Virtual Book Club or just search it on my website. Anyway, we meet every other Tuesday from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time. And for the first half an hour, we discuss the book that I've picked. And the second half an hour, the author always comes and joins. I've never turned one of those conversations with the author into a podcast before, but this one was so unique and amazing. And while I had interviewed Anne Lamott maybe two years ago, early in the podcast history, I hadn't uh, revisited my relationship with her or had any... um, updates in a while. So I just thought, how can I keep this just a book club? So I'm releasing the Q&A from book club as a podcast. It's about 30 minutes long. And Anne Lamott, whose bio I will now read, is just such a legend and did not disappoint in any way. Um, I hope you all enjoy this. And I hope that for those book lovers out there who want to meet authors every other week reliably and ask your questions and also discuss books with smart, like-minded friends, uh, join my book club. It's fantastic. Okay, so here's Anne's bio for those of you who don't know. Anne Lamott uses honesty, empathy, and humor to write about our world. In her beloved and best-selling books, like Operating Instructions, an account of her son's first year, Bird by Bird, her classic book on writing, and Help, Thanks, Wow, a celebration of prayer, Lamott delves into what makes us human. She explores the wide experience of life that unites us, birth and death, parenthood and family, faith and doubt, love and loss, forgiveness and hope. In each of her 19 books, which have sold millions of copies worldwide, Lamott brings her distinctive mix of bracing candor, clarifying insight, and refreshing humor to convert serious subjects like addiction, motherhood, loss, and faith into human truths we can all share. She's the author of several essay collections on faith, including Traveling Mercies, Grace Eventually, and Plan B, as well as several novels including Imperfect Birds, Blue Shoe, and Rosie. Lamont has been honored with a Guggenheim Fellowship and has taught at UC Davis as well as at writing conferences across the country. Academy Award-winning filmmaker Frida Mock has made a documentary on Lamont titled Bird by Bird with Annie from 1999. She's also been inducted into the California Hall of Fame. She lives in Northern California with her husband and family. My original podcast with Anne was on her book Notes on Hope, and this book club centered on her most recent book, which just came out called Dusk dawn night. I hope you enjoy it. And don't forget, sign up for Zibby's virtual book club and enjoy this amazing conversation. Here I am. Hi, hi. Hi. Thanks so much for coming. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. How long will we be doing this for? Six hours. Does that work? Uh, uh, like mothers have time. For that <laughs> 30 minutes. We'll be done at, at three Eastern, 12. That is so perfect. I am setting my, we've had power outages. And so none of the clocks work. And so I'm infinitely confused, which is not unusual. But I am here at your service. Thank you. Well, thank you so much from everybody here at Book Club for coming. We're so thrilled. You have so many super fans here in this Zoom audience. So thank you so much for coming. Is this live or is it Memorex? It's live. We're all here. Oh, my God. (laughs) Well, we have so many questions, but first wanted to just say how much this book, we were actually just talking about how this book seems so hopeful, despite the fact that your last book was called Notes on Hope, or that was in the subtitle. This book really felt so hopeful to all of us and that there was this, yeah, the sense of optimism that pervaded this book that I don't feel like was there as much in the last book. Did you feel that way when you were writing it? Well, I started writing it because when I was on book tour for the book on hope, Everywhere I went around the country, people were just completely hopeless and defeated. 
and scared to death, you know, and it had been a couple of really troubling years politically, let's say, and, you know, and scary things were happening at people's dining tables, and the UN climate change reports had just come out, so I started writing a book on where we start with so much bad news that was not so much about hope, but about restoration and renewal. That's the subtitle, Renewal and Courage. So I really wrote it with the intention of offering more hope, Hope Mm 2.0, to the people that had come to my events for the Hope Book. (laughs) By the way, I I meant to say that like you, I have also taken my dog's medicine and lived to tell about it. Oh yes. my God, I'm not the only one. Yeah, I have. And I was pregnant at the time. So I was, oh I was my God. freaking out. Yeah. So the medicine I took of my dog for my dog had been banned for human use by the FDA. And I'm sure yours had been too. Well, my OB, who I called frantically, told me to call her if I started barking. So <laughs> so I relaxed. It was nice to know I wasn't alone in that. One of the women here wants to know what your new husband, Neil, thinks about this book and how he feels about being being written about like this. Well, I run everything by everybody. So I run it by Sam and I run it by Neil. And he loves it. I mean, it's all like, it's stuff that everybody can identify with, you know, that that, you know, we, we were married two years and one of them was in quarantine. One of you know, I took my vows almost two years ago. I'll be 67 next month. I mean, next weekend, oh my God. So I'm still 66. And we got married April 13th, 2019. And one of those years has been in lockdown, which I did not know was going to be part of the deal. So... <laughs> It was a little bit unusual, I think, and I should get credit for. But we've been talking about all of the stuff that we find annoying about each other since like the third date. So he he's really okay with it. You really have to run stuff by the people you write about, though. And that's my agreement with everyone is that I would never, I'd never run anything by that. I mean, write anything that it was embarrassing or private. You have a saying with him about the cat, like, is the cat in the living room for when you're feeling, you know, very hopeless or stressed about something? And I was wondering if you have had any of those moments recently where you've needed to say that to each other. Yeah, the piece is about this, you know, there was a cat codicil in our our marriage, which was that when he asked me if I would marry him, I thought he was going to ask what color patio pebbles we wanted to get because he put in a little garden and he said, will you marry me? We'd been living together for two years so, or something and our cat had either run away or been stolen a few months earlier and I said, can we get a new cat? And he said, yes. So I said I would marry him and then so we got a five-month-old kitten and of course she immediately disappeared into the, the wormhole that only cats can see. And of course, if you grew up around alcoholics, you learn to prepare yourself for the worst. It's one of the ways you have any control at all or around the mentally ill. And so we, I just instantly, after about an hour of looking everywhere, literally everywhere, and I mean that literally, inch by inch, we couldn't find her and I knew the kitten was dead. And we did what we did to try to stay centered and faithful and together in it and then all of a sudden a couple hours later I felt this furry little whisper of presence that then then began to nibble on my toes (laughs) and I realized the kitten is almost the cat they're they're almost always in the living room they're very very rarely dead so I wanted to get pins for everybody like me who worries more than the average bear and the pins would say the kitten is not dead the kitten is in the living room and I really live by that you know, in, in lots of different circumstances. And we say it to our, to each other, the kitten's not dead, Annie. Neil, the kitten's in the living room. I love that. <laughs> One person wanted to know, who do you look to for inspiration? Oh, I love that question. You know, I'm in recovery, so I have a lot of 12-step people at my beck and call. So when I, but I never call them or my mentor, horrible Bonnie, unless I'm completely boxed into a corner. And I've, I've tried to self-will myself into, you know, figuring it out. And I want to say figure it out is not a good mantra. And then I call one of them and they'll say something like, oh, I'll call and say I hate everyone and all of life. 
and they'll say, oh, I'm so glad you, you called. <laughs> and they'll say, oh, I was there too. Let's go to Target. You know, or we've got leftover Easter candy. Why don't you come over or I'll come over there and I'll make you a nice cup of tea and we'll eat all of my child's Easter bunny uh, bunnies. And spiritually, I turn, I, I have a lot of day at one day at a time meditations, you know, that come and they really break the trance of my own pinball machine, toxic thinking. And like Richard Rohr, you all know Richard Rohr, I bet, R-O-H-R. He's so lovely. I think he's a Franciscan, but I could be wrong. He's from Santa Fe, and he has a contemplative ministry. And so if you Google him, you can get him. You can get a tweet or a email or text or something every single day that is about quieting, you know, the, the pinball mind and getting centered and back into life and into the understanding that life keeps supporting us, partly because... Largely for me, because we have such incredible, we have two or three best friends. The reason I have so much faith in life and God is because I have such incredible best friends. So the Richard Rohr is a great one. And, you know, you can get daily things from people like Byron Katie. And my son Sam has a website called hellohumans.co. And he has interviewed people that help us bring hellohumans.com was taken so he's hellohumans.co and there are inter, it's free I mean I think you might have to join for four dollars which is a cup of Starbucks but he ta- does interviews with people like me and Jack Cornfield and Byron Katie and Paul Williams and somebody I love so much but my, I'm so sorry my mind has gone blank but just go there there are a thousand or there's a hundred interviews on people that will help you break the trance of misery and fearfulness and faithlessness. And oh, Paul Williams, the great composer, and who wrote the art? Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way. You can listen to her for an hour talking about how she writes, how she gets fully human when she feels that or most freaked out. I'll tell you the thing from Paul, like if you go to Paul Williams today, he and Sam are both in recovery, but he said something that I live by because most of my books are about how I've tried to seek peace or affirmation or respect outside of me from the New York Times or for, from Oprah or finding the right guy or finding this or achieving that or whatever. Sam and Paul Williams were talking one day, I mean not one day, on Hello Humans, Paul told him the story of having gotten his the Oscar one night, you know, 30 years ago. I think Paul is clean and sober 30-some years, and Sam is clean and sober nine and a half years, the greatest miracle of my life. And Paul said to Sam, you know, I stood there, 100 million people were watching me receive the greatest accolade you can receive. And he said, it bought me 24 hours, <laughs> you know of good self-esteem and respect and, you know, self-love and, and it's not, and so if I listen to these interviews, I remember over and over again, it's not there, it's not out there, it's an inside job, it's radical self-care right now, right now, right here, it's a, it's a cup of tea, it's a best friend, you know, I just went in and told my husband something so humiliating that happened this morning for me at Kaiser in the dermatology waiting room and then bathroom and I got to tell him and he didn't run screaming for his cute little life he's a year younger so he just said oh honey that happened to all that happens to all of us a couple times a year you know and I hope that you are taking radical self-care of yourself right now because that is something universal after the age of 60 it will happen. Don't cough, don't sneeze without preparation. So that's what brings me inspiration is telling the truth to people and sharing how embarrassing life can be and how lifey life can be some days. So that's a great question. Thank you for that answer. It makes me think of when you say can you love me now? The way that you always are just wondering if yeah. if there's something you could do that could finally turn him away. And the way, can you hear me now? Can you love me now? Yeah. Well, that's based on the fabulous TV commercial. I'm not even sure if they still run it. I think it was for AT&T, but it could have been for Verizon or any of the phone companies where 
you'd have to walk all over the property or the, the street or the pavement or the house trying to get decent reception and say, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? But what this article, this piece in Dust Night Dawn is about is telling each other stuff. You know, it's not the beautiful, lovable stuff that is hard to tell your closest people, but the stuff that you feel sort of ashamed of or you just can't believe everybody does it. And and then you keep thinking, can you love me now? <laughs> okay, well, what about now? Okay, wait, I haven't told you this one thing. What about now? Can you love me now? And of course, the person just loves you more and more because they tell you the truth, which is they've done it too, thought it, almost done it. They did it this morning. And then you get to laugh about it. And as soon as you can laugh with somebody about it, you're halfway home. Laughter is carbonated holiness. There is a question here from Karen Phillips that I would love. Can I ask myself a question? Sure, go ahead. Zibby. Yeah, take okay. over. The, no, you take over. Just I saw this question I love. What would you say to caregivers who are trying to keep it together for two households struggling? Oh, God, what I would say to you is we are thanking you for your service. I had my hardest years when my ba- when I had a baby 31 years ago, who 31 and a half years ago, as a single mother with no money and no dad around. And it is hard to capture the existential exhaustion of that. And plus, I had to make a, try to make a living for us, which I was not able to do. And I had to do one of the hardest, hardest things we do, which was to ask for help, to ask for the rent. And so I did it. And I was afraid a lot of the time, so I did things afraid. And I did things badly. You know, there's a chapter in my writing book, Bird by Bird, on shitty first drafts and on writing stuff really badly, kind of doing it like the Nike commercial and doing it afraid and doing it badly. And that's what I did, and that's what I would say to you, that when you're struggling... You know, there's another chapter in Bird by Bird that perfectionism is the voice of the oppressor and it's the voice of the enemy and it will keep you cringy and small and bitter your whole life. And so the secret, if you have the perfectionism, you're trying to do it beautifully and perfectly is to do it badly, (laughs) to do it. You know, I mean, I wish you could all see my office because I can't pick up my desktop and show you, but it's just it's just bits of paper everywhere that I hope and pray and assume will turn into something. And and those are just the two things that I can reach you. Here's something you'll love that is an index card on which I spilled seven up. So all the so all the writing <laughs> bled. But you know what? I can read it through the bleed. And and that is really the best advice. Thank you. Carolyn Karen, I'm so glad that you're, do, you're doing it. You know, you do it badly. That's the secret of life. No one told me that when I was a child. People told me that I, you know, I, I was I, in operating instructions. I wrote that I was 35, had a baby before I realized that a B plus was a good grade. You know, no one told me. I grew up to do perfectly in school and to be a perfect daughter and, you know, reader and conversationalist. And no one said that a B plus is actually a fantastic grade. What they said was how hard, how much harder would it have been to, to get an A minus? But the trick was, if you got an A minus, was there still time in the quarter to get an A? And that's that's a cross I had to bear. And I sort of lost my train of thought, but the, the thing I know is shitty first drafts and small assignments with writing and with your morning and with your afternoon, with your little ones, and your job, and your aging parents. You can, you know, we do what's possible, and that's awful news. With my writing students, I had them get one-inch picture frames and only write as much as they could see through that one-inch picture frame. And then the bad mind, the, the, the critical voice says, well, where is that going to get you? <laughs> one passage, one paragraph, one what? It's going to get you to the next one. It's going to get you to feeling really, really amazed that you got some writing done this morning or you got your work done and the kids were entertained and you let them watch a little bit more TV or be online a little bit more so that you can 
do a little bit more and you can be there for your parents who are struggling, who are older, who are scared. You know, you do, we do what's possible. These questions are so great. And there's a question about forgiveness, that it's the hardest work we do. The whole book is about forgiveness. Yes. It says the hardest thing is forgiveness. How do you continue to dig deep for that? That's from Daphne. Oh, okay. I'm just so glad my son isn't here because he's just mortified by my lack of technological skills. He goes, oh my God, mom. But anyway, I also want to talk about, somebody wants to know about Sam's sobriety. So I'll do these two questions first. Forgiveness. I mean, this is forgiveness school here and it's hard because it's hard, you know, and people say, well, you can't forgive anyone until you can forgive yourself. And people just like to hand out nice Christian bumper stickers and I don't find them all that helpful. And I do practice radical forgiveness. And I have learned at 60, in my 60s, to be, do this with myself and to say, it's okay. If somebody did something really awful to me or even worse to my child, it's really hard. And so I try to figure out through that one inch frame if there is any aspect of it where I can I can do forgiveness, or I call it forgiveness-ish. <laughs> and I might call them. I might, you know, I sent someone a book. Well, I'm not even sure if they're speaking to me. But I wrote a really sweet note, and I said, you know, there are a couple stories in this book that I thought you might really love. And I hope you're well. That's all. It's so subversive to do something nice with whom you have, to someone to whom with whom you have a real conflict. There's a piece in here, so I won't wreck it for you, about forgiving our parents, even though they've been dead forever. The self-forgiveness is, you know, it's an action. Figure out is a bad slogan. What's the action you can do? You know what? I bought a pair of pants that I saw on Amazon. <laughs> no, I saw them on People Magazine with a link to Amazon. And Katie, who was married to Tom Cruise, Holmes, was wearing them and they looked so cute on her. Well, I'm 25 years older and probably 30 pounds heavier, but I went and ordered them because I do believe it's out there and that if I, I can buy it, achieve it, date it, lease it. And I got them in a medium, which I'm a medium. I'm 5'6", I'm 140, I'm a medium. And they the buttons were five or six inches apart. They weren't even close. They weren't where you could take them to the seamstress at the dry cleaners. And I just felt sick and I felt so mad at myself because I really do eat a lot more in, you know, COVID. I'm bored. It was Easter and the whole thing. I have so many excuses and I'm just going to stick to them. But so I had to send them back. And you know what I did? I said out loud, fuck it. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? You know, if I'm here in forgiveness school. My best friend's son died three months ago. My grandchild who lives here has been at, he's uh, in sixth grade. He's been at, he's missed his friends for over a year. We have a friend here today and they're six feet apart in masks. And that'll be fun. But it's not the same as roughhousing and grab assing and shoving and pushing and sitting together and being silly, right? But we do what's possible. So I thought almost anything I can think of is more important than whether I can fit into pants that Katie Holmes looks cute in, right? So I got my, my, myself back. And once I have myself back, I mean, this whole book is about finding your center, you know, that the center does hold with a couple of good friends. Someone's, can't see what her name is. Ellie is touching her center right now. She's going around. If you can touch right here, I mean, collectively right now with Ellie as our leader, touching our center, breathing into that center, you're way more than halfway home. You breathe into it. Ram Dass calls it the heart cave. You know, where you, if you have a higher power, you definitely had a little girl, a little child who might be scared and lonely and worried that she's not enough or not doing well enough or not a good enough mother or daughter or spouse or whatever. And just touch that solar plexus and breathe right into it. Breathe into that heart cave and then, you know, believe me. Oh, my God. I got those pants back by that that afternoon. I, I had those pants returned. And I got the welcoming pants. You know, the world has enough opinions about it as it is without your pants getting in on it, too. So somebody wanted to ask about my son's sobriety and the miracle of that. 
the miracle of that was that I'm in a 12-step program for people with tiny, tiny control issues and people who are trying to get their teenagers and their young adults to do what the parent thinks would be a very excellent idea for the child. I, my child was a mess head and an alcoholic. He had a baby at 19, you know, and it was very, very hard. It was not what I had in mind. <laughs> and, um, and he'd been to re rehab and he was dealing now. I mean, things had gotten worse. And I finally set a boundary. His baby and his baby mama were living with me and Sam was showing up drunk and stoned. And I finally said, you know what? It doesn't make any sense for you to show up at our property for your baby to see, two-year-old two to see you. But come back again when you, when you have a little time under your belt. And it was awful. It was the worst day, literally, of my life. I held a sharpened pencil to his throat. And I said, you can't be here on this property. You're too crazy. Go get help. I love you. I love you the same, but get off of this property. Ten days later, because I got my sticky fingers off the spaceship and released him to the care of his own higher power and at the catastrophe of his own behavior, which is the are the only two things in the in human history that ever got anybody clean and sober. I did that work in my 12-step group of Al-Anon and I released him and 10 days later he called and he said, I've got a week. These guys in Marin County, in the San Francisco County, have shown up and taken me under their belt and I haven't had a drink in seven days. Can I come back? Of course you can come back. We miss you more than we can capture in words. Can you come for dinner? So that's the story. And these guys, I mean, I'll tell you my favorite riddle is what's the difference between me and God? Anybody know the answer? God never thinks he's me. And once I realized I was not God in my child's life, I'm not my child's higher power, I'm not even my own, I'm a retired higher power, then all sorts of miracles happen. And the miracle that my family got was that my son hasn't picked up a drink since September of 2011, I guess it would be, yeah, 2011. So we have time for a couple of quick more questions. You're in charge of all things. Okay, yes, we are in charge. We are, let's see if there are any other questions here. Here's a question I love. I love from Carolyn Platt. I love your exchange with the Texan with the bouffant hairdo. And when you said to her, I can't ever repay your kindness. And she said, in a thick Texas accent, can't, never could. That line, those three words. So this is a story in the book when I'm in Miami. I'm one year sober. I'm a mess. I'm very, very high up, like on the 20th floor. And I'm thinking of jumping because I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted by my condition. I'm exhausted by staying sober. There are like 40 little tiny bottles of booze in my refrigerator. In the, and I did the hardest thing I do. I picked up the 200-pound phone, and I called a hotline. It was almost midnight. And I said, I'm a sober alcoholic from California. I'm scared. I'm alone. And I don't know what to do. And, and this young man said, oh, well, we'll send, we'll send you someone. Don't worry. Just stay there. Don't do anything until she'll be there in 20 minutes. It was like, what? You're sending someone to my hotel room in 20 minutes? Said, yeah, yeah. And this elderly woman, much, much older than I was, who had like 30 years clean and sober, shows up. It turns out she's in a pink Cadillac. So I believe I've seen the car of God. And she comes to my hotel room. And she, we have a cup of seven up or something from the mini bar she calls the front desk and asks them to please take away all the booze and we share our experience strength and hope and our terrible stories of early sobriety she makes me laugh and the line that with the bouffant is that it really was like up to here and she said what ann richards always said was the higher the hair the closer to god and that's when i said i can't ever repay you you know it was late and she was old and she said can't never could so I rarely say can't anymore. Do you have one more question at your end or do you have a way that you want to well, close up? Maybe I could just, I would love to unmute everybody because I know we have so, or everybody can unmute themselves and maybe just say a quick hello to you because everybody was so excited to meet you and I seem to have monopolized this yeah, say conversation. Hello to so everybody unmute and yes, just- God say, bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Thank you, everybody. Aww. I love being here. Thank you for coming. Thank okay, you for coming. bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. 
Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 